Hello again. Um, the last video was talking about the kidney. So the next logical step would probably actually be the bladder thinking about it, but I'm not that logical. So um, I was going to talk about the adrenal glands, the suprarenal glands, the glands that sit on top of the kidneys, right? Uh, because that's what we were talking about this week in teaching. We do the kidneys and the adrenal glands together. So um, let's talk about the adrenal glands. Let's have a look and see where they are um, in relation to some other structures. Let's think about their blood supply and venous drainage and also their lymphatic drainage while we're there. And their innovation, and their innovation is particularly interesting and we might have to delve into a bit of embryology to talk about their innovation. But do you see this? Not this. 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 We built a wall. We finally, we've got a big teaching room. We've finally separated our big teaching room into two smaller rooms that we can make lots of noise in and do practical teaching in. But it's also a whiteboard. And it's a whiteboard that nobody's drawn on yet. So it's just asking for me to draw on it. So we'll use that to do some diagrams as well. At least I hope it's a whiteboard. Cost 20,000 pounds. What if it's not a whiteboard? Well, we'll find out, won't we? Okay, then, let's get some models. We've got this fella here who is going to be no use at all. Um, whereas we have this hefty model of the posterior abdominal wall with muscles and kidneys and stuff. And the torso. How about... You're usually very helpful, but how about we move you over here? You... Because you're going to be a lot more helpful. Oh, you've lost a bit of an eye support. Oh. So if we look at the kidneys, we find the adrenal glands. Now, here's the right kidney, here's the left kidney, and see how when we have, with our kidneys we talk about an inferior pole and a superior pole, and the adrenal gland is sat on top of the superior pole of either kidney. Right, so look at the blood vessels. Here's the inferior vena cava, here's the aorta, and can you see? So it's actually disappearing behind some muscle. Can you see that? So what's this muscle here? It's the diaphragm. So this is the gap between the crura, these two slips that anchor the diaphragm to the, to the vertebrae, and the aorta is disappearing through that gap to pass between the thorax and the abdomen, right? So that means that this, all this curve here, this is all diaphragm. So the adrenal glands are nestling up against the diaphragm and nestling up against the crura of the diaphragm. And look at that three-dimensional shape there. This space is made up from vertebrae and muscles of the posterior abdominal wall. So look how the kidneys are very much posterior within the abdomen and the adrenal glands with them. Notice also then that the inferior vena cava is on the right, so the right adrenal gland is nestling up against the inferior vena cava, whereas the left adrenal gland is nestling up against the aorta here, right? And I'm using the terms adrenal gland and suprarenal gland, but they're interchangeable. They both mean the same thing. I think suprarenal gland is probably the contemporary term, but I'm not sure. So supra and ad mean upon, renal means kidney. Um, if we look at the torso and take this apart, if we take the liver out, you can see here, there's the right adrenal gland. There's the inferior vena cava, and here's the, the kidney here nestling behind it. If we take the stomach out, there's the spleen, here's the pancreas, and this here is the adrenal gland on the left side. And you can see the shape of the aorta there. Uh, sorry, you can see the shape of the, the diaphragm here forming this posterior wall that they're nestling into, right? So if we take these out, then you can see the kidneys and the blood vessels and what have you. So bear that in mind. Okay, so that's where the adrenal glands are. Now the adrenal glands have a really rich blood supply. Do you know why? Because I'm not sure I do. 
Um, there are three arteries that supply blood to each adrenal gland. Those arteries are very sensibly named the superior suprarenal artery, the middle suprarenal artery, and the inferior suprarenal artery. So far, so good, right? Um, the superior suprarenal arteries come from the inferior phrenic arteries. So we have, you see these blood vessels here? We have these blood vessels here coming from the aorta that um, supply blood to the diaphragm. So hence they're the inferior phrenic arteries. And those will give off uh, superior suprarenal arteries to the adrenal glands or suprarenal glands up here. Um, you will find um, a pair of middle suprarenal arteries coming directly from the aorta, so they're lateral branches of the aorta supplying each adrenal gland, suprarenal gland. And then you will find, uh, we can see that here, uh, do you see here? So here's the renal vein, underneath that, deep to that is the renal artery. And look, from the renal artery, we have this suprarenal artery here. This is the inferior suprarenal artery coming from the renal artery and going to the adrenal gland. So it's typically described that the superior suprarenal artery will maybe give up to 10 little branches to the suprarenal glands. Um, the middle and inferior will give one or two branches, but I mean, you have a lot of blood going to the kidney and a lot of blood going to the lungs because those things are processing the blood, just like the liver does. But these things aren't processing blood, are they? They're making hormones and stuff, which are rather um, active compounds. You don't need a lot of them. They disappear off around the body and have a lot of effect. They have a wide range of effects at low concentration. So why are there so many arteries supplying blood to these glands? I don't know. If you look at the veins, they only have one vein each. So it's typically described that the suprarenal gland has a suprarenal vein, a single vein on either side, and on the left side that drains to the renal vein, because of course the inferior vena cava is pushed to the right, so it drains to the renal vein as it passes across. And normally it's described that the, the right uh, suprarenal vein drains directly into the inferior vena cava. But you can see on this model we have a suprarenal vein draining to the renal vein here as well. Um, so which is more common? I don't know. But there you go. It makes sense anatomically that it would drain to either of those. So the suprarenal glands have a lot of arteries supplying blood to them but just one vein draining blood. And they're making hormones, so the hormones are going through that vein, not around the body, right? Weird. I wonder why that is. Maybe it's embryological. Most organs will have a hilum, uh, a point at which uh, vessels and other things will enter and leave an organ. The adrenal glands don't have that. The adrenal glands are surrounded by a capsule. So those arteries and veins, instead of entering and leaving through a hilum, they, they pass through the capsule at a number of different points into the adrenal glands and from there they then branch and become smaller and smaller and smaller and form capillary beds and what have you. So that's also a little unusual. So what about the lymphatic drainage? Given what we know about the blood supply, what's the lymphatic drainage likely to be? Well, the lymphatic drainage is gonna follow the veins and around the, uh, the, the aorta here and uh, the vertebrae, we have these paraaortic lymph nodes and these lymph nodes dotted down here in the posterior abdomen. So the drainage of lymph from the adrenal glands is likely to be to these lymph nodes nearby, and then the lymph will flow to the cisterna chile up through the thoracic duct and onwards. Uh, tumours of the adrenal gland do occur, so metastatic cells might leave through lymphatic structures and get embedded in those lymph nodes. Okay, so... If the kidneys are surrounded by perinephric fat and they're within that, that fascial space, then the adrenal glands are also surrounded by that, that same perinephric fat and are within that, that fascial space. So they're, they're held kind of with the kidneys. The capsule of the adrenal gland keeps it separate from the kidney, but otherwise anatomically they're in a very similar space. So structures you would go through to get to the kidney, you would also go through to get to the uh, adrenal glands. So that's the location, blood supply, uh, lymphatic drainage. 
Um, the shape of the lymph, the, um, the adrenal gland, as you might have been able to see from these, is, uh, is kind of a triangular pyramid, right? Let's draw that. So you kind of got this pyramid shape, this, this triangle, and like other organs, you also find a cortex and a medulla. So you've got a medulla in the middle, in purple, and it's in the medulla that we find the cells making adrenaline, uh, noradrenaline, or epinephrine and norepinephrine, if you're of that persuasion. Um, and it's the cells of the cortex then, so the, uh, blue so let's do red. So the cortex is around there, and the cortex has three layers. Whoa. And if you look at the histology across here, and you look at those cells, those cells and those layers look very different because those cells are different and they're making different things. But that would be the, the cortex. So these are the zona fasciculata, the zona glomerulosa, and the zona reticularis. And the cells in here, these are the cells that are vital for life. You can't live without your adrenal glands, and not because of the adrenaline. You could live without adrenaline, but that would be a very boring life, right? These cells within the cortex of the adrenal glands are making corticosteroids, mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids. So they're making important things like um, cortisol, um, aldosterone, um, sex hormone precursors. Although that bit's less important, actually, to be honest. But cortisol is crucial for regulating the metabolism of fats and proteins and sugars and regulating blood glucose, um, regulating blood pressure, things like that. Aldosterone is important in regulating also blood pressure, blood pH, blood salts, salts within your body, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and these are really, really basic functions that allow your cells to function. If those things don't work, your cells don't function, you don't work. Um, the sex hormone precursors that they make, the androgens and what have you, are overshadowed really by the gonads and, and, and how effective the gonads are and how much sex hormone the gonads make. So that's less important. Um, but the, the adrenal glands are really, really important. Now, what about the innovation? Now, to describe the innovation of the adrenal glands, I need to revert to a little bit of embryology. Yay, it works, kind of. Might need to give it a bit of a... It's a whiteboard, it works. It's a white wall. I could just go on forever. If I cut a transverse section through the embryo at about this level, so... Uh, Here's the posterior abdominal wall. This is mesoderm at this stage. Imagine you've got your, you've got your GI tract down here somewhere and you've got your mesentery going around it, right? You've got your neural tube here, your early spinal cord, uh, and all this sort of stuff going on. So this is you know, around week five. We find the adrenal glands start to form not near the kidneys, the kidneys are a much more complicated story. You get three pairs of kidneys forming, two pairs disappear, the, one, the final pair survives, but they actually start off really low down and they migrate up. No, the adrenal glands actually form near where your gonads begin to form. Now your gonads form <laughs> in your abdomen and then they descend down to their final positions, right? And that's why we see these blood vessels trailing through the abdomen. These are the gonadal arteries and veins. The gonads started to develop up here. They descended, trailing their blood vessels behind them. So the adrenal glands actually start to form at the same level that your gonads start to form. I know, it doesn't make sense, but... You know, that's, that's just biology. So what we see at this level up here in the abdomen is we see um, a condensation of mesodermal cells, right? In this, in this layer of mesoderm in the posterior abdominal wall. And what this condensation is then, these are cells that have been instructed to start to form the adrenal glands. So they clump together, they proliferate, they start to differentiate, they start to organize themselves. And these cells are going to form the cortex. 
of the suprarenal gland. Uh, now we do have some other fun cells up here. Now these guys, these guys come up time and time again. They're an absolute favourite. These are the neural crest cells. Neural crest cells. Now the neural crest cells are great as the neural tube is forming, as the crest is starting to appear. Um, we find this population of cells here. If you track and follow these cells, they disappear off across the embryo and do all sorts of wild and wonderful things, making different parts of the body. Uh, these cells that I've, I, I've highlighted here, they just migrate a little way away from the spinal cord and they form the sympathetic trunk. All right? So you know the sympathetic trunk from which sympathetic nerves run. So you know about the sympathetic nervous system, right? If you don't, there are some other videos. We, we generally describe the sympathetic nervous system as fight or flight and the parasympathetic nervous system as rest and digest. Anyway, these neural crest cells are going to form the sympathetic ganglia, which are a little way away from the spinal cord. Now, some of these neural crest cells see this going on. They see these forming adrenal glands and they think, aha, I want to get involved in that. And they migrate and push into this group of cells here. And they will form the medulla of the adrenal glands. Now, what this means is that the cells of the medulla of the adrenal gland, these cells that are making adrenaline and noradrenaline, are actually modified uh, sympathetic neurons. They're called chromaffin cells, um, just because of the way they stain. Um, which means that these cells are hardwired into the sympathetic nervous system. The adrenal gland is part of the sympathetic nervous system. So when your fight or flight response gets activated, uh, the sympathetic nervous system and adrenal glands aren't working separately from one another, they're all working together. Uh, and these cells release their adrenaline, it goes into the blood, disappears off around the body and hits all those adrenergic receptors and does all those wonderful things. Um, it, it causes vasoconstriction and vasodilation, so blood goes to muscles but doesn't go to other areas of the body where you don't really need blood right now. Um, it releases glucose from glycogen stores in the liver and the muscles. Um, pupillary dilation, rabbit in the headlights. Um, it causes an increase in heart rate, an increase in um, heart stroke force. Uh, uh, and by doing all these things, it actually increases cerebral perfusion pressure and coronary perfusion. Basically, you get turbocharged by the adrenaline that gets released into your blood. And then hopefully, you will survive the thing that has caused that fight or flight response. You'd either run away from it or you'll fight it, but whatever. Anyway, so that's my point, is that the embryology describes how the adrenal medulla is connected to the sympathetic part of the central nervous system. Um, so that's it. We've covered the adrenal gland in, in structure, location, blood supply, nervous innervation, lymphatic drainage, and briefly described what it does, but really for an in-depth understanding of, of the things that are made by the adrenal glands, you need to talk to an endocrinologist or look at the physiology because you don't really want to take each of these hormones on its own. You want to look at their whole cycle and how they affect other things. And It's great fun, but it's not really an anatomist's job to tell you too much about that. Okay, All right.